Welcome to Executive Leaders Radio, your spot in the corner office, the radio show where executives share their secrets to success. Executive Leaders Radio. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio, broadcast from WHYY in Philadelphia. This is your host, Herb Cohen, with my co-host, Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight Frank, Peter Snelling, Merrill Lynch, Andrew Hamlin, Hamlin Creative, and Jeffrey Lipson, Layer 8 Security. Uh, uh, Peter, could you give us a rundown on who we have on the air today, please? Sure, Herb. Uh, First, want to thank Bill Morazzo for hosting us here at WHYY. We're joined by Josh Seven, President and CEO of the International House Philadelphia, Gerald Wick, Partner, Century Business Consulting, Brian Glick, Founder and CEO of Chain.io, and Mike Dershowitz, founder and CEO of Rethink Staffing. Let's get to our first guest, Josh Seven, president and CEO of International House Philadelphia. Josh, what is International House Philadelphia? What are you guys doing? We're a nonprofit in West Philadelphia that provides a community and housing for international students and programming celebrating international cultures. How many students and how many different countries are they from? In a given year, we have about 1,000 students living with us from 80 different countries. Wow, what a community. Where are you from originally? I'm from Philadelphia. Which part of Philadelphia? I uh, grew up in Germantown and moved to Lower Marion just outside of the city. When and how young were you when you moved? Ten. Uh-huh. Drew? Wow, that's a big move at 10. How, how did moving from Germantown to Lower Marion affect you? Well, I think it was, uh, it was at one of those life stages where um, uh, I was able to try some different things. Before I moved, I was a very, very introverted kid, just happy playing in my room by myself kind of for long amounts of time. And when I moved, I just got very social just v- very quickly and uh yeah and di- did you meet anybody that kind of helped bridge that gap or oh, i know there was one uh, there was one friend in particular right right the summer before that move uh my parents uh you know introduced me to a kid who became kind of basically my best friend for the next several years and, and how did he help you well you know the whole introducing with other kids and that bit of just feeling comfortable at 10 years it, it can feel like a really big move so mm-hmm. um kind of hitting the ground running feeling Shannon? like you got a wingman Josh, you mentioned your grandmother was the internet before internet. Can you explain what you meant by that? So a grandmother who was just really well informed about such a diverse set of issues. Anytime I sat down with her, it it felt like what today is an internet search. Uh, just exploring different topics, parts of the world. Just a deeply informed and interested person. You, you mentioned that your grandma was a free spirit. And uh, I'm just curious, how did her kind of free-spirited lifestyle affect you as a leader? Yeah. I think she taught me that irreverence um, can be a really good and effective thing. Um, She was the kind of person who was uh, saying the controversial thing or maybe in a way that was a little uh, Mm -hmm. brusque at times. And so Mm -hmm. I feel like I I take in from that that um, you just shouldn't take the conventional view. You should should always be looking for the that Your grandmother did a lot of traveling. And uh, give us an idea of what kind of country she traveled to. And did you ever go with her? Um, Such a huge range around the world. Uh, Guatemala, Greece, Romania. Did you ever go with her on any of the trips? Yeah, I had a chance a couple times. Uh How did that influence you? Well, in some ways, you know, the whole uh, Internet before the Internet thing, I felt like I was always traveling the world if I was sitting in her living room in Princeton. Is that one of the things you enjoy about your job nowadays? 80 kids, at the, 80 different countries, 1,000 kids? Yeah, I, I love it. I, again, I, that, that intellectual curiosity, recognizing it's a big world out there, mm-hmm. um, and International House really cool. uh, providing Shana, that Didn't community. you have a question regarding sports or something? Yeah, what activities were you part of growing up? A um, lot of different sports, but really focused on rowing crew. And what was your role on the crew team? I was the stroke. And how does that affect what you do today? Well, the the stroke is the the person at the front of the boat who sets the pace, um, sets the rhythm. And I think it really did set a lot of, uh, taught me lessons about leadership and confidence around it. Not only are you setting the pace throughout a race, uh, you're doing so not even seeing what's behind you. So you need to have a lot of confidence in your uh, internal clock, in your ability um, mm-hmm. Jeffrey? Josh, you mentioned traveling with your grandmother. Was there a particular trip or place that you enjoyed the most? I had a chance to uh, join her in a place called Cuernavaca, just outside of Mexico City, uh, when I was in college. Mm-hmm. Did um, you mention something about Bethany Beach? Oh, well, that was uh, much closer to home uh, mm-hmm. in southern Delaware. Mm-hmm. I was probably, no, that was my favorite place in the world. Uh, why why was up. that? 
Well, it's every August it was the family vacation, and it was just capital F fun, normal kid stuff, you know. At, so, at the beach. so of all the traveling, did you say it was your? You say it was your favorite place. It was because it was fun. And what 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 does uh, what does Bethany Beach? How's that influencing the way you're running International House nowadays? I think sometimes people feel like as you get into your work life and things get serious, you're supposed to squeeze fun out. And I think fun has to be a central part of your work day and your work life. How does that, fun? How's that? How's fun show up in International House? Well. Um, We've got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, 20-something people who have a lot of – you don't have to teach them much about how to have fun. They, they bring it themselves. I think just encouraging that and, and bringing some of that energy and creativity. How, how, do you go, how do you encourage that as the leader? Well, you know, encouraging people to think of new and different events uh, with the students. Um, you know, th- 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 there's – you know, even I, – I try to make sure every single meeting there's at least one or two major belly laughs. And, and if, if, if I don't see it happening in the meeting, I'm, I'm going to try to do it. I think it's just uh, it's good for the heart. Aren't those activities the, the glue that holds everything together at International House? It's a huge part of it, right? It's um, uh, engaging people uh, in the community off their campus mm-hmm. and with one another. Um, that's gotcha. really what makes it Peter? special. Josh, you mentioned that your grandmother was somewhat irreverent, and I would imagine she was fun. Did you think that? Do you think that her influence on the family created that comfort to have fun? And mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it was a style that uh, sometimes uh, didn't always rub everyone the right way. But I was, I was completely on her wavelength because also somebody who was very, very witty and thoughtful. So it, you really it, appreciate people that are different. It sounds to me like you really appreciate the uh, eighty different countries that are represented at International House with a thousand kids. It sounds like you really are enjoying people that are different from around the world. Is that true? Absolutely. I've, I've always felt that. Any activity, any place I've been, um, and I bring that into work, I, it's that diversity of perspectives that brings creativity, it brings richness, um, makes you realize as much as you focus on something, you don't have all the angles. You get a more diverse set of people together. You get a richer landscape. Is, uh-huh. is laughter a cross-cultural experience in, in your experience? Oh, yeah. I, I think I tend to be somebody who's very uh, extroverted and I have a big belly laugh. And I realize for some people it's very understated. It's funny. In terms of that diversity, sometimes what I most like is sitting next to that person who just mutters a quiet aside, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the very subtle way. So I think just like around anything, there's every flavor of laughter out there. But it is. Cool. Who's got the next core. question? Uh, Shannon, uh, Jeffrey, Drew? What, what's, what's the most important part of the culture at International House? I think openness. This is recognizing people are coming from a lot of different perspectives. And, and so I think that openness to different experiences, different perspectives. Uh, we have people living in suites together. It's 10 people. They can be in the range of different programs, areas of study, parts of the world. So openness. It, it's, it sounds kind of like your grandmom, how she had people in and out of the house all the time. Yeah, when, uh, you know, she was more than half the year traveling internationally, but when, when we had a chance to spend time, her living room, you just never knew who was going to be there. I, it was always uh, somebody really different. That was just, uh, and, you know, cultivating that community and that sense that it's a place where that's open, again, I, I try to um, uh, foster that at International House. Is the International House a place or is it a, f- a feeling? Is it a how do you describe that? It's definitely a set of, of, of values, I think, um, around building community, uh, around celebrating diversity of cultures, creating something greater from that diversity. But it's very much a place. I mean, we, we, we have, have a building that is the, the lifeblood, and I, I think of it really as a hub. It, it's a hub for different people and activities. What kind of, when, when you were a kid, what kind of activities were you involved with? Oh, well, I mentioned rowing, baseball, still a huge, huge baseball. Did you mention theater, actually? Theater, yeah, yeah, I I, I got into that. um, Is there any part of International House which reminds you of theater? Uh, well, we, we do we do have an auditorium where we do have a lot of uh, um, uh, performances, cinematic and live. Um, to this day, like I still you. I still just love. Um, it's part of the job I love is getting up and speaking and. and yeah, it sounds groups. to me like a lot of stuff that happened in your childhood. The fact you were involved with theater, the fact that your grandmother had this had this broad perspective, the fact that you were the stroke at crew. It's like it prepared you for this gig at, as leading international house. Yep. Same guy, just a bit more gray hair. <laughs> what, um, 
What's the website address of this organization known as International House Philadelphia? It's ihousephilly.org. ihousephilly.org. What's the best part of your job, Josh? It's it's the people. It's it's the students and my team uh, kind of cultivating um, I, I House. Um, it's the people. So you really enjoy your job, it sounds like. It doesn't feel do. like a job. I do. It's, Let me it's have that great. website address one more time, please. iHousePhilly.org. We've been talking with Josh Seven, who is the president and CEO of International House Philadelphia here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com. Learn more about our executive leaders back in a moment right after this break. And your name and company is? Peter Snelling with Merrill Lynch. And Peter, what do you do for a living? Well, our group provides wealth management and retirement planning services for companies, their employees, and executives. So you're helping companies, their employees, and their executives with their wealth management. And what kind of stuff does that encompass? Well, we focus on goals-based wealth management, which really means trying to find what uh, is most important to people about their money and then proposing solutions to meet their needs. When you say helping them with their money, so it's like, so they're planning for marriage and they're planning for anniversaries and weddings. Educating children, retirement, uh, helping parents, helping children. What's the website address of this organization? uh, ML.com. And let me have your name one more time. Peter Snelling Peter Snell. with Merrill Lynch. Peter Snelling with Merrill Lynch. And the website address one last time? It is ML.com. ML.com. And this has been your business spotlight. We'll be back in a moment. We're back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Gerald Wick, who is a partner with Century Business Consulting. Gerald, what, what is Century Business Consulting? Century Consulting is a, an accounting firm, but rather than audits and tax, we help our clients get ready for audit or go public or raise money via help with uh, preparation of financial statements and policy procedure. Work. How large or how small is this organization? Uh, we have just over 50 employees at this mm-hmm. point. And where are you from originally? I grew up in Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. And that was a small town in Pennsylvania, right? Very small. Uh-huh. How many brothers and sisters? I have one older sister. And where were you doing 8 to 14 years old? For as long as I can remember, I, I've been uh, an entrepreneur at heart, um, trying to help out wherever I could. I uh, definitely learned that from my parents. Wait, 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 wait. You were an entrepreneur definitely trying to help out. I thought that entrepreneurs just wanted to make money, but you mentioned help out. What are you talking about there? So my parents always took the, the chance to help everybody, um, whether it was neighbors or um, family or friends, and pretty much no matter what they needed, whether they needed their car worked on or um, if they needed help uh, mowing lawns, whatever it might be, which sort of dovetailed into a lawn mowing business for them on the side and, and clearing snow and, and the like. True. Joe, what did your parents do for a living? So my mom is an executive assistant and my dad is in maintenance. So we was always uh, working on odd, odd jobs, uh, fixing cars, whatever. You, t- you know, we learned a lot about your parents. They, they, to me, they, they taught you two really important things. Number one is the golden rule. Um, and I just say, you know, how does the golden rule affect your leadership style today to do for others without really receiving a payback? I, I think that was a really important. My, my parents were always the people to give their, their shirt off their back if, if they thought you, it could help you out. And I think that's really affected me and my, my leadership style. Um, I take a lot of time to try to make sure that my team has what they need um, and that I'm helping them uh, as much as possible um, to, to make sure that the outcome is, is what, I, what, what it needs to be. The, se- the second lesson was a sense of community. I mean, I, just being in a small rural town and your parents kind of doing things for the neighbors. You know, how does, how does that affect you as a kid, and, and what does that mean to you today? I think that's really shaped who I am. I, I think growing up um, in a small town, uh, again, when I moved to Philadelphia, things were a little different. You hold an elevator for someone, and, and people are confused by that. But <laughs> I think that that's really helped uh, grow the firm uh, significantly because we, we help our clients. We, we want to ha- always be the people to, to answer the phone and, and help out however we can. Shannon? And- Drew, growing up, did you sit down for dinner and eat as a family? We did. We did. Um, I would say pretty normal, but my, my dad got off early um, at around 3 o'clock, and we always had dinner around 4 or 5. And how does that affect your your relationship with your team and your clients? 
I think that has helped me um, realize the importance of, of community and of actually being together. Um, I prefer in-person meetings versus emails and, and phone calls versus you know some other type of medium. Um, and I think just being together and sharing information has really driven the, the leader that I am and, and also the, the firm. Jeffrey? As a young man, Gerald, was there anyone who had a lot of influence in your life? Yes, yeah, so I, I had a um, I had a lot of really great mentors in my life, but the the one that probably stands out the most is um, I had a neighbor growing up um, who was pretty successful and uh, you know taught me a, a little bit about the leader that I wanted to be. Um, I used to do some some work for him odd jobs. Um, he was the first person that I can remember that told me I did a really bad job on something, um, and while I was upset at the time, it's it's really led me to try to be a pretty open communicator, um, especially about expectations and he also had a Porsche 911 which in Shippensburg was pretty rare uh, so that was um, it made me really want to be successful and work really hard and 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 you know be similar to him mm -hmm. when you have a teammate now who has done a bad job do you give them that same feedback I do um, I I have read a lot of books and what have you about the appropriate way to give um, direct feedback. I think his feedback was maybe a little harsh, but at the end of the day, I think it's really important to give great feedback um, and really mention maybe what somebody was doing correctly, but um, you know, say, hey, here's, here's how you could have done it better. I believe very heavily in mentoring and I think a big part of mentoring is, is telling somebody um, where they can improve and, and whether they take that or, or not is, is sort of up to them. Peter? So growing up in a small town, some might describe that as a place to get away from, but you saw lots of opportunity there. Tell us why. What is, where did that hunger come from? Well, in, in a small town, it's, it's true there's not necessarily a whole lot to do. Um, you know, extracurricular-wise, but there's a lot of opportunity to help neighbors uh, mow lawns, um, fix cars, uh, clear snow. Uh, I, I spent some time um, emptying uh, uh, or moving hay around. How has that affected your business life now when you engage with a client? How do you look for those opportunities? Well, I, th I think that Growing up the way I did, I think we found a lot of opportunity to, to help people. And, you know, one of the things that uh, drove me to Century was when the audit world got a little bit more about compliance. Um, I was an auditor in my, in my uh, previous life, I'll say. Um, it, it became more about compliance. You really couldn't help your clients at all, and there was a, a large void between uh, what was trying to get done and, and what the auditors were allowed to help with. And um, I think growing up early on and recognizing opportunities to help is really what drove me to and still be excited about Century to this day. Did, did you mention as a kid you uh, learned how you could fix anything? What was that all about? Absolutely. My, my dad was constantly uh, working on something, taking it apart and putting it back together. Um, and, you know, I think as it relates to, to Century today, um, that's, that's what we do a lot of times. There's a lot of, uh, I'll say, messes out there, and, and we take them apart and, and put them back together the right way and um, prepare the financial statements, what have you, to, to help companies get to that next level. Yeah, your nature is really to fix things as opposed to uh, do audits, it sounds like. I mean, you really are a fixer. You really enjoy getting in taking a look at the numbers, figuring out how, how you can help the business. When you're, when you're going in, even though you're an accounting firm, it sounds to me like the numbers just help tell the story. Am I correct about that? That's exactly right. Uh, there's so many other, so many other parts. And, and a big part of what we do sometimes um, is help companies realize what numbers they should be looking at. Um, it's not necessarily all the numbers or, um, you know, what fluctuation should they be concerned with. And also, you know, even just procedurally what what could they be doing better to help their their business run a little bit smoother on the financial side or on the operation side so you have an eye for what's important it sounds like as opposed to being caught with a lot of clutter you know your help your help uh, your help gathering the numbers and then figuring out which numbers really are the indicators that are the most important am i correct about that or am i wrong no that's that's true i i 
I believe that the what's led to that, you know, of course, being a CPA and, and having the background I do. But when I joined Century, it was, um, you know, just Mike, my, my business partner. And, you know, we collectively, the two of us grew it to where it is today. So I think that we have real world experience on top of helping numerous clients in numerous industries and across the, the country and the world. We've also done it ourselves. How, so. how, how large or how small is the team? Uh, we're over 50 professionals now. So you've grown a business from just the two of you to 50 of you. So I guess, you know, you guys really do know what you're not just consultants. You're actually doers. I mean, you're living the uh, you're living the experience. So when you're talking to somebody about building their business, you actually have the practical experience. That's that's correct. So we know uh, the pitfalls. We know some things that we wish we would have done maybe a little bit differently. But but on the other side of it, absolutely. We know what to look at and how to dissect things to really get what, what we need out of it. Shannon, you got something else you're thinking there? Your parents taught you hard work at a young age. What do they think about what you're doing now? Uh, they're, they're proud. They're pretty excited. They, they tell me I should work less, though. <laughs> <laughs> Drew, what do you think? I, I was going to ask a similar question. I, I'm just curious when you're kind of challenged with a decision that needs to be made at the office, what advice do you hear your dad giving you? So... I'd always start with people first, and, and that's the way the firm has really grown. Um, my my parents were always, you know, people first and, and execute sort of second. So um, I focus on uh, most of my decisions on what, what's right for the team. Um, you know, we, we really put our team at the at the forefront. You know, the client um, is somewhat secondary, um, but, but really it's about the overall firm and, and the team that, that is where most of that um, – my, that's where my dad would probably tell me to focus. Gerald, what, what, what's the website address for Century Business Consulting? It's www.centuryconsulting.com. Uh, how do you spell that? C-E-N-T-R-I consulting.com. We've been speaking with Gerald Wick, partner of Century Business Consulting here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website. It's executiveleadersradio.com. Learn more about our Executive Leaders Radio. And we'll be back in a moment right after this break. Back, you're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Brian Glick, founder and CEO of Chain.io. Brian, what is Chain.io? What kind of stuff are you guys doing? We're a software company that helps connect all of the shipping companies around the world so that everyone's packages can hopefully show up on time. And how large or how small is this company, and how old is it? We're about 20 employees, and we've been in business two years. Uh-huh. And where are you from originally? Uh, I grew up in about five or six houses around southern New Jersey. Uh, how come you grew up in five or six houses around southern New Jersey? Well, my uh, parents got divorced when I was about eight, and uh, mm-hmm. so there was a lot of moving around and bouncing around, remarriages and the like. Mm-hmm. How many brothers and sisters? I have one younger brother. All right. How young were you when you started working? Uh, I was about 15. Mm-hmm. And what were you doing? Uh, I got thrown in the deep end of the pool uh, working for a computer consultant uh, who would send me out to law firms uh, where everything was broken uh, and sort of leave me there and say, make it fixed. Why would this computer consultant send you out at the age of 15 to different law firms? Why? Because when I came back to the office, things were fixed. I got it done. So and you- I, I figured out how to, get, how to do it, uh, even when it seemed like it was impossible. Excellent. Drew. Yeah, I'm just curious. What did you learn from that experience, kind of getting thrown into the bee's hive of, uh, you know, fixing stuff for demanding customers? Well, I, I learned, first of all, that you if you sit there and you just push through, you're going to get it done. And that there's really no reason to be afraid after the first one, because what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to yell a lot. Yeah, and how has that transitioned into what you do today? Uh, it really makes us uh, willing to take on any challenge because, again, it's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, we move boxes. We're not, we're not doing heart surgery, and we'll figure it out, and we solve the problems. And you have an interesting amount of self-confidence to you, even when you describe your childhood, which some would think was rocky, but you have a big smile on your face. Where where did that come from? Uh, I think uh, a lot of that comes from the dinner table and from the fact that, uh, you know, my father was an attorney. And so everything was sort of uh, verbal combat at the dinner table. And you learn to you learn to win arguments and you learn to uh, to kind of take your lumps. And after a while, you learn, hey, it's it's not so bad and, and you can kind of do anything. 
Did you? Did your dad ever actually let you win any of the arguments? And he still hasn't. <laughs> Shannon? Your parents went through a divorce when you were eight. What was the role you had with your brother during and after that divorce? Uh, you know, it's interesting because we bounced around uh, between the houses, you know, every week, visitation, but we were always together. And, you know, as the big brother, it was kind of, I always saw myself as I had to be out in front and, you know, sometimes kind of get out in front of the problems for him. How does that relate to the way you build your team today? Uh, I think even to this day, my, my team uh, knows that if, if we do, you know, something breaks or there's a problem, I'm going to uh, be the leader who's in, in the front of the pack instead of the back. And, you know, I'll take the hit, even if it wasn't even if it wasn't me uh, behind the scenes. Jeffrey? You mentioned your grandfather was a World War II vet who was into computers when they still called them machines. Was he an influence into your decision to go into technology? Uh, yeah, between my uh, grandfather and my father, they were. Uh, I was lucky enough that they bought me a computer back when I was uh, when you had to build them yourselves. And uh, you know, I think the bigger influence my grandfather had though was he was extremely kind uh, and always taking care of other people and. You know, combining that with the toughness of coming in the law firms, you know, I learned to come out of my shell and, and really balance those two things. Well, what, what do you mean coming out of your shell? What are you talking about? Uh, you know, coming out of that environment as a kid of, you know, being sort of mentally combative, you can, you can kind of build up a wall. And it wasn't really until uh, I didn't really grow in business until I learned uh, to be vulnerable and to, uh, you know, be nice and that there's a way to get business done that is non-combative. I'm not trying to say you didn't really grow in business until you learned to be vulnerable. I don't understand what you mean by that. Uh, well, what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, businesses and international shipping, and it's, it's a tough-nosed business, but ultimately you've got to have people working together. And it's much easier to get people to work together if you're nice to them. And if you understand and can empathize with their side of the transaction, then you can, uh, you can build positive situations instead of uh, looking at everybody as uh, somebody to, to beat. But where's the word vulnerable fit into that? Uh, vulnerable fits in because, you know, the way to build connections with other human beings is to show them that you're a human being. And I think we lose a lot of that in the business world where everyone can't show that they made a mistake and they can't show that there's a, you know, that they do, that they're human beings. Uh, are you more like mom or dad? Uh, I, I like, I think I'm a good hybrid of both. My, my, I get the, the toughness from my father and the empathy from my mother. And it's sort of interesting. I mean, you know, here you are a computer guy, and you're talking about empathy and vulnerability. It's sort of interesting that, you know. We, we look at ourselves as a people company first, and not just in, in sort of the we take care of our people, but that we bring companies together with connections, and that's project management. That's understanding what people need. And then we get the ones and zeros to move around the bits and bytes. That's The tech part's actually pretty easy. It's the project management and the people part that's Hard. The project management and the people part. Project management. So you're like helping organize people, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, we're, we're, we get customers who tell us I have a 1,000 vendors and 50 warehouses, and I've got to figure out how to make all this information move between them. And that's, that's tens of thousands of people who have to coordinate. That's the hard part, not the technology. Brian, that, that sense of humility that um, you bring to the negotiation between the counterparties, how, how do you teach that to your Teammates. Well, that's, that's actually the, the interesting part, though. I mean, isn't that the issue, though? It's the uh, it the is. vulnerability and the coordinate. It's the being the human being. Yeah, and it's the way we t teach it is by building an environment where people can make mistakes and where we support each other. And you know, as the the old uh, sports cliche that you uh, you play like you practice. And so, in the office, we're supportive. We have a positive culture, and it, it comes out with our clients. When did that emerge in you? How did that? How did you change to reflect that? Uh, that emerged through me making every mistake in the book and thinking that you did business by attacking people and seeing that it wasn't working. And thankfully, uh, having enough mentors and guidance to uh, people telling me I was being stupid and that there was a more pleasant way to live my life. Drew? Brian, self-reflection <clears throat> seems like it's very important to you. I you spoke about it in the green room, and it's kind of in every answer you give here. How, how did you realize that reflecting on the past is important to what you do in the future? Uh, you know, I, I always tell my team, don't do it the way I did it, which was making every mistake. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was... Uh, relatively miserable person who was being pretty successful at their job and realized uh, that there's another way to do it. Um, there's a company in Chicago called Basecamp that uh, put a lot of stuff out about how you can live life in a positive way and still be successful, and uh, I really appreciate the work that they've done. 
Mm-hmm. Shannon, what else are you thinking? Brian, you mentioned to me earlier that you have a 10-year-old daughter. What have you learned from her? <laughs> what have I learned from her? I, uh, I've learned that she can be positive and be tough and that she is combative like I am when it comes to arguing, but that she, uh, that she was able to learn that empathy much earlier than me, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about that with her. Wow. Jeffrey, what else are you thinking? You mentioned empathy several times. Have you been able to translate that to having your teammates also share your empathy? Uh, yeah. I mean, we, uh, we always tell everyone our, our core principles are nice, accessible, and professional, and nice comes first, and we hire for that. That's, uh, we, we tell people that before they come in for the interviews so that people can self-select out. If you, if you want to be a jerk, go work somewhere else. It's sort of interesting because you're a software logistics kind of company, computer kind of company. You're talking about people and being nice to people. But I guess if you're helping your clients figure out all their logistics stuff, it's all about the people, isn't it? It, it is. And, and it's, a, it's an environment where you've got com- shipping companies who are competing with each other who have to work together. And it's very, very easy to fall into these traps of looking at the person across the table as an enemy or someone you can steal business from. And everyone makes more money when we work together. That's interesting. So why, why do the shipping companies have to work together? What do you mean? Well, so, uh, you know, on one deal, I might be doing the air freight and you might be doing the warehousing. And on the next deal, I'm doing the freight and you're doing the warehousing. And we all have to exchange data. And uh, we're competitors some days and we're partners other days. It's a very complicated industry. So that's where your software comes into yep. play? Yeah, so we sit as a neutral party in between so that these companies, instead of having a directly interface, which is often hard, we work with each of them and then we are kind of the universal connection in between. And that's dependent upon the best rates and the best routes and the best timing and so on and so forth. And forth. service. And uh, a lot of the, the global supply chain is really complicated and really fast moving. And uh, it, every day they're dealing with different clients and different systems. And it's it's really uh, mm-hmm. interesting problem solving. What's, what's the website address for this uh, organization? Same as our name, chain.io. Let me have that one more time. Chain.io. And your name is Brian Glick, your founder and CEO of Chain IO. Uh huh. What's the uh, what's the best part of your job? Uh, best part is that we have uh, a fresh set of problems every day. There's always a shipment late. There's always a system broken, and we get to go to work and never have the same day twice. Mm-hmm. And website address one last time. Chain.io. We would speak with Brian Glick, founder and CEO of Chain IO, here on Executive Leaders Radio. We'll be back in a moment, right after this break. Want to help building your business with help from this show's CEOs? Our CEOs can help you uncover more opportunities, grow your sales, connect you, help you raise money, all the big issues, because our CEOs have been there and done that. They've succeeded in creating millions of jobs and earning millions of dollars, and some are available to advise you. Now, email mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. That's mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. The same CEOs you've heard on the show for 10 years may be willing to help you build your business, uncover new opportunities, grow your sales, connect you, help you raise money, all the big issues, because our CEOs have been there and done that, succeeding in creating millions of jobs and earning millions of dollars, and some are available to advise you. Now, email mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. That's mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. We're back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, and we'd like to introduce Mike Dershowitz, who's CEO and founder of Rethink Staffing. Michael, what is Rethink Staffing? What are you guys doing? Rethink Staffing is a social impact outsourcing company. We've currently got delivery centers on two continents in Asia and here, uh, actually in the Kensington neighborhood of Philadelphia. We're about 300 people. We'll, uh, we're growing pretty fast, so we expect to double that next year and triple that the year after that. Mm-hmm. And where are you from originally? I am a center city kid. Mm-hmm. How many brothers and sisters? I am an only child, Herb. What makes an only child special? Well, an only child doesn't have built-in playmates. Mm-hmm. Um, so what happened to me is uh, my parents divorced when I was quite young, uh, about two years old. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I was, I was probably the kid that was supposed to save the marriage. 
when they realized that that wasn't going to happen, um, they decided to go ahead and divorce, and, and I ended up, to a certain extent, becoming my parents' playmates as, as I continued to get older. Hmm. So you're, you grew up pretty fast, huh? I did. Uh, being an only child can be a, a bit lonely, and so you, you have to know how to make friends and navigate the world and, to a certain extent, get people interested in you. Mm, ah, perhaps where your marketing ability came from, Drew. Mike, it sounds a, li- a little bit of a rocky upbringing. Was there any stability in that situation? It was a bit of a rocky upbringing. I, I got passed uh, around a bit and, and was always sleeping in a different bed every week. Uh, one, it was luckily only one or two beds, but uh, that was the way it was. But I had a grandmother. Uh, I grew up here in Center City, uh, right at, at Rittenhouse Square, and my grandmother lived across Rittenhouse Square. So from a young age, back in the 80s, I was allowed to walk to her house, and, uh, and that's where I was every day after school. And, and what did Grandma teach you? So Grandpa taught me that uh, value, uh, and that's actually economic monetary value, is in itself a, a fluid concept. When I was young and go there after school, she used to give me chores around the house, and she would uh, pay me at the end of every day. And at the end of every day, she would go into her change purse, lay out change on the table, and said, take what you think you're owed. Um, and it really taught me uh, you know, the value in those days between a dime and a quarter uh, based on what I had done. And and today, when you're making tough decisions at the office, do you ever hear your grandma whispering anything in your ear? I would tell you that 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 happened so young and was so frequent that her value system or assessing value is now innate. I don't know that I hear her voice, but I know it's always there. Shannon? Mike, um, you mentioned in the green room that you started making money at eight years old besides the money that you made with your grandmother. Can you tell the listening audience more about that? Sure. So I went to a a Tony private school here uh, in Center City called Friend Select, and uh, there was this this wonderful woman who I'm still friends with named Sharice Brown, who uh, she lived in North Philly. Her father was an interesting character, owned a lot of real estate and some bars, and but he wanted you know he wanted his kids to still live where where he grew up, and so they had this compound in North Philly, and next to their compound there was a, a penny candy store uh, where you could go in back then and, and buy a lot of candy for a little bit of money. Sharice brought in a bag one day full of candy, and I said, "How much did that cost?" And she said, "It was a dollar." And I'm like, "All that candy was a dollar?" And she's like, "Yep." And I I looked at her and I said. We can make a fortune. Um, so we took her penny candy and sold it for five cents to the rich kids in my private school, uh, even though I was just the, the son of a school teacher. And, uh, you know, we did well for eight-year-olds. How is that influencing the way you've structured your business model nowadays? It's very simple. There's a lot of asymmetry uh, in markets, meaning there are a lot of inefficiencies. And so what I realized there was that because the rich kids at Friends Select didn't know the true value of candy or know that they could buy it cheaper, they were wasting money. And frankly, a lot of that is, is part of the business model in globalization and in the outsourcing industry, which is what Rethink Staffing ultimately does. Mm-hmm. Jeffrey? They say we learn about parenting from our parents. Were there any lessons that your parents gave you now? Uh, Well, not necessarily about parenting, unfortunately. I think being single parents, maybe my parents, if they had chosen again, may not have chosen to be parents. Um, And so a lot of the the parenting values that I have now, because I have have three boys myself, uh, generally my wife has been a great teacher because she had a very stable uh, family life and and great parents who are wonderful people. But I've had to learn a lot on my own. Um, I've had to learn by observing. I've had to, I, you know, I rely on my success coach to help with parenting problems sometimes. So, you know, my parents taught me about the world. And for that, they shall always have credit. Uh, they taught me both the highs and the lows. My mother used to go off to Greece every summer to, you know, to, to be with her, her boyfriend on a Greek island and not take me with her um, and stick me in, in, in overnight camp. But, you know, between her and, and what she exposed to me and my father, um, who worked in some pretty rough neighborhoods, they gave me a very interesting, wide variety of experiences. And, and frankly, they, they gave me no fear, uh, or they never instilled a sense of fear in me about the world. And I wouldn't be able to do what I do today without that. Mike, as a young yeah. entrepreneur on one of your trips to Asia, you had a profound experience. And how did that shape what you're doing now? Well, it, it was clear that, uh, that the BPO industry in general, the outsourcing industry, was missing the boat. It was missing the boat specifically economically about what it could do to combat global poverty. And so as a result of that experience and, and some really bad experiences uh, that I've written about pretty publicly on my blog page, my Medium page, it was clear that I had some ideas from economics that could help not just people, but also the industry do a better job. And, and that's what we, we really are dedicated to at Rethink You Staffing. mentioned, though, that you saw a young boy and you made a mental comparison. Tell us how that influenced you and why you're so passionate. 
So I was walking down the street in uh, our hometown of Iloilo in the Philippines um, on an early trip there. And uh, I was hungry because my time was all screwed up with the time difference. So um, there was a 7-Eleven down the street from my hotel, and I was walking there. And in the doorway uh, on the street, there was this family of three people, a a father, a mother, and a child. The mother was in the back of the doorway, the child was in the middle, and the father was in the front. They were protecting the child, even though they were sleeping in a doorway. And the father held his hand up perpetually, even though he looked like he was sleeping, begging for whatever coins. The child, though, was just talking, talking incessantly. He was talking in a language called Hiligaynon, which I don't speak yet. Um, And he had so much energy and ideas. And it struck me very sadly that thus for the misfortune of the location of his birth and circumstance, he could have been my son, Zachary, who was exactly his age at the time. And Zach is very much like him. He talks all the time and he's loud and he's very passionate and enthusiastic. And my son will inherently be more successful than that boy will be, thus by the consequence of his birth here in America and being born to, to, to parents who care and who have the means to care. So is, is Kensington in some way kind of like um, the Philippines to you? or So the economically, and I look at everything through the lens of economics, economically, Kensington, uh, unfortunately, economically depressed inner cities in the United States very much have uh, the same economic conditions for the people who live there and intergenerational poverty that the Philippines has. So the, the Kensington is our way of experimenting with a model that we've developed in the Philippines to say, you know, can we lift people out of intergenerational poverty here the way we are in the How Philippines? How important is that to you? Well, as a Philly boy, it's extremely important. Um, Why? Because I want to I want to help. I want to do good. We are a social impact company. The basic thesis of what I'm trying to do is that you know, about, we can. How about the money, though? It's isn't it about the money or I mean, you're doing it for the money, right? No, we 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 do both. Right. I mean, we're not necessarily a profit maximizing business, but we do well while doing good. I mean, I like my trips and I like staying in nice hotels. And that's a huge part of what we're doing because we're able to combine doing well and doing good. Could you say one's more important than the other? No, actually, I won't say that one's more important. I would say that if you if you can't do both, I'm not interested. Mm-hmm. I just want to go back to your three sons real quick. What's the one core value you hope to instill in your, your boys? Uh, I guess kindness is probably the word. Um, but more importantly, I want them to understand that they do come from a background of extreme privilege. Um, I mean, we're not, you know, we're not billionaires or anything, but... By being born in America and by doing the things that we're able to afford to do and by eating at the places that they eat, I want them to know that the person serving their table at dinner or lunch deserves no less respect and kindness than the person with whom they're having lunch or dinner, uh, whether that restaurant is fancy or not. Is giving those boys stability important to you? Uh, So that's an interesting question, and it sounds like you've been talking to my wife. Um, I believe that my boys should have a diversity of experience. So we do live overseas every summer while they uh, pursue their academic interests here during the year. Stability, yes. It's my wife and me. We will always be there unless something happens. But uh, stability of place, no. Strictly speaking, I don't believe in that. So you believe in the diversity. It's one of the kids you're taking. Where have you taken the kids overseas? Uh, So the kids have been to... I think it's eight countries now. Uh, we were living in Germany this summer. Uh, this coming summer, it looks like we're going to be living in Austria. Uh, they've been uh, to Canada. They've been uh, to where else? They've been to Switzerland. Why do you do this? Places. Why do you do this? Because I think it's important for my kids to learn about the world, to learn that America is not the beginning and the end of the world. What's the uh, website address for your organization called Rethink Staffing? So it's RethinkStaffing.com. RethinkStaffing.com. We've been speaking with Mike Dershowitz, CEO and founder of Rethink, the Rethink Staffing here on Executive Leaders Radio. Uh, Peter, can you give us a rundown on who sure else we've can. had the opportunity to Great show. Yeah. I want to first thank Bill Morazzo for hosting us here at WHYY. And we had Josh Seven, President and CEO of International House. Jerry Wick, partner of Century Business Consulting. Brian Glick, founder and CEO of Chain.io. And we just finished with Mike Dershowitz, founder and CEO of Rethink Staffing. Excellent. Let's get uh, let's get some thanks for Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight Frank, Peter Snelling, Merrill Lynch, Andrew Hanlon, Hanlon Creative, and Jeffrey Lipson, Layer 8 Security. I'd like to thank you guys for co-hosting. Let's get some website addresses real quick. Josh Seven, International House, your website address is? iHousePhilly.org. All right. Mr. Wick, Century Business Consulting, your website address is? CenturyConsulting.com. And Brian, Chain.io. 
Uh, Brian's not here. It's chainio.com and Mike Dershowitz. Rethinkstaffing.com. And Brian is chain.io, uh, just chain.io. Perfect. Thank Brian, you. You're and uh, don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com, to learn more about our executive leaders. Have a nice day. Bye bye.